Welcome to the Liar Secrets Podcast, the podcast about gaming and being a geek by two 40-something geek dads. I'm Ken Newquist, and once again, I find myself falling backwards through time and space. This time around, David and I bring our summer 2021 summer reading lists. I think I just said summer way too many times. <laughs> I'm David Moore, uh, and I seem to have come from a time stream that is a bit ahead of Ken in time. Uh, I've already finished some of the books on my summer reading lists, uh, or I might be doing summer reading lists wrong. Uh, since this is my first conscious attempt at one. Woohoo! So this is, uh, I think, I don't even know how many lists I've done at this point. A whole bunch. You've done a so lot. Welcome to the summer reading list party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I've I've followed yours for years, but uh, have never consciously put together a list myself. And uh, only in the last couple of years have I really gotten back into reading. I've always enjoyed it, but. Life and work usually are the two things that get in my way, and I've been consciously saying, no, I'm setting aside this time for actually just reading, because that actually brings me more enjoyment than scrolling through social media and things like that. Yes, definitely. And so I think, I think if I, if I peer through the mists of, of time and space, uh, we were just talking about our 2020, our, our 2020 uh, summer reading list, the 2000 reading list. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> we, got, we would have gone way too far back in time yeah. uh, in, in the recent episodes that have been published. So I won't overly talk about uh, the history of my summer reading list and all that kind of stuff. Suffice it to say, come up with a big list, read it every summer. Um, and so this summer, I've got some particularly interesting challenges going on, as we've been talking about for quite some time. Uh, I'm going to Philmont, New Mexico. Uh, well, actually, it's Cinnabon, Cinn Cinnabar, New Mexico. Uh, to the Philmont Scout Reservation this summer. Scout Ranch this summer. Gosh, my brain is just not fully functioning yet. <laughs> uh, but it, don't worry, guys. Once I shake off this time fuzz, it'll all be good. Anyway, the point is, I'm going on a big, huge backpacking trip this summer. And I have no idea how much I'm actually going to read. We're going to be there for 14 days. Obviously, I get to read on the plane and read on the plane back. Um, and we have a, two days when we first get there where there may be some time for reading. On the trail, I have no idea. Like... We'll get into camp. We'll have activities. So I'm going to bring my Kindle and I'm going to throw a bunch of books on it. And we'll see how much actually gets done. And then uh, later in the summer, then uh, that's sometime in July. And then later in the summer, we're going to be uh, going up to Lake Champlain again to hang out with our friends at their cabin. Um, and I will endeavor to read even more books there. So cool. the, uh, the first book on my reading list that I wanted to talk about is Watership Down by Richard Adams, which is one of my all-time favorite books. Like it's right up there with like Stephen King's The Gunslinger and Isaac Asimov's Foundation. Like this is this is just a book I've read entirely too many times. Uh and but I haven't read it I don't know, probably in 30 years. Like I don't think I've really read it since college, maybe. Hmm. Which just blows my mind. And so for those of you who don't know about Watership Down, uh, it is an epic book about rabbits escaping the destruction of their warren and then attempting to find a new home. So have you have you read Watership Down or seen Watership Down? I have David? seen it. Uh, it has been many years since I saw the animated version. Uh, and I remember it being quite sad, at least in portions. Um, and But I've never actually read it. So it, it actually leaves a mark, I think, on our generation. <laughs> Especially, I think I'm... Uh, you know, I, I know I, I'll tell people about uh, Watership Down. They'll go, is that the one where the rabbits kill each other? And I say, yes. Yes, it is. Uh, and so the as part of this, like, it's it, Richard Adams does this fantastic job. It was in, inspired by, like, Homer's Odyssey. And the book starts off with these rabbits. And there's this, like, prophecy or this this one rabbit who's got basically got ESP. And he can, he knows that the warren is going to be distra destroyed to make room for a uh, housing development, right? And... Thanks to his pro, they try to warn the rest of the Warren. Nobody listens. So they, a handful of them escape and decide they're going to go off and found a Warren somewhere else. And so then they have these epic sort of like these little vignette stories that happen along the way as they're questing for their eventual home, which is Watership Down, which turns out my, I think, six-year-old self did not know this when I went to see the movie, that Watership Down is like a down is in a hill, not a sinking mm -hmm. <laughs> so i was very confused when i went into the movie in the first place because i thought it was about something else entirely and then rabbit show right up, right uh, i i think r really quickly uh your leaving a mark on our generation is very apt because as you said when you were six <laughs> years old you went to see this 
Uh, yeah, it was. It's like, <laughs> it's like, hey, it's a cartoon. It's safe for kids, or or even when they're introducing it as a book to kids, it's like you're young kid. It's like, it's like you know, going to there's as as my kids call them, uh, the dead dog books. You know, uh, when you go <laughs> and it's like in in grade school and middle school, they give you these books, and the dog dies at the end, you know, or is killed or whatever. You know, it's like. Who who is picking these books to traumatize these kids this early in their life? And so I actually I loved it as a kid, and I, I when I realized I think I saw the movie, and then I realized it was a book, and then I read the book and totally loved the book, and then went back and watched the movie when it finally came out on on VHS. And and the thing is, is that at the time, my I loved Watership Down so much that I didn't quite understand how traumatizing it was to others, and so I was babysitting. Uh, I was like, I don't know. I think I was in high school and I was babysitting this kid. And I, I like, I loved Watership Down as a kid. He would love Watership Down. Cool. So I'm going to show him Watership Down. And I think I had mentioned it to his parents and they were okay with it. Um, but I think none of us had actually remembered the trauma that is Watership Down because it begins with like the, within the first like five minutes, the Warren is destroyed and the fields run red with blood. Like I'm not Literal. being figurative. They right. literally Literal. run red with blood because, you know, there's this prophetic vision and what have you. And so, like, I had to turn it off after five minutes. I scared the crap out of him. Um, but I still love it. And because it's this great sort of um, Homer-esque quest type thing, I'm going to read it while I'm at Philmont. If there's only one book I read while I'm at Philmont, it's going to be Worship Down. I'm going to bring a paper version so that I don't have to rely on any technology. If I manage to finish it, then I'll move on to the Kindle and read some other books. But... Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Unfortunately, the paperback that I used to read the heck out of when I was in high school has been, I don't even know what happened to it. I think it fell apart. Like it was, it, yeah. it was held together mostly by scotch tape. I have a, I have a so couple I don't think it survived like college. <laughs> yep. I do have a question for you though. Have you made sure to get a good case for your Kindle? And are you going to put it in like a waterproof I, bag <laughs> in case there's rain? So I, I have, uh, I have the paper white. And so that is uh, water resistant to a certain depth. Um, and I do have a good solid case for it, but I do actually have several wet bags uh, that I in my in my pack. So I think between those two things, it should be fine. Cool. I think I think we may have just mentioned this before, but I've been through like I don't know three or four Kindles at this point. That's why I at brought least it two up. of them. <laughs> <laughs> at least two of them were destroyed on scouting trips because somebody threw a backpack on your backpack on top of my backpack. Yeah. So yeah. now I have a nice. It's got a nice hard cover to it. Cool. And it's one of those covers that, like, when you open it, 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 it like, turns on the Kindle. So it's great. I, hopefully it'll hold the charge the whole time. Uh, but Watership Down is my go-to book just as to have an actual paper book. Yep. Because, you know, you, you want to make sure you have it backed up, right? We work in technology. You don't right. want to count on <laughs> yep. it actually working. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might want to, like, when you leave for Philmont, turn off the Wi-Fi on your Kindle so that it will give you that yes. much little more battery. Because it will try to connect yes. every so often, and that's really yes. the the big battery sucker. That's what I've encountered. I mean, the, I, I'll use the backlight light. display somewhat. Right. That that's so. I, I mean, you have to be very. I have a headlamp, and I'll be bringing extra batteries for the headlamp and what have you. So I'm going to try and conserve the Kindle as much as possible. Because if you're just doing an e ink, it'll last for like at least a week, maybe two. I don't right. think it lasts quite as long as the older ones used to, but um, it is a little bit more robust. So. Yep. What's uh what's the first book on your list? All right, first book on my list is one I actually finished it. I listened to it in Audible. It was Fuzzy Nation by John Scalzi, uh read uh narrated by Will Wheaton. And it's actually a as they put it a reimagining of H. Beam Piper's 1962 classic Little Fuzzy, uh which I read would have been high school. I, I love that book. Um, it was not quite my your watership down level, but it's about uh, <laughs> humans going to another planet and they're effectively, you know, taking all the resources. There's like a small colony there, but they're all company people. And there's evidently a galactic uh, government that has given this company the mining rights to this planet. But one of the clauses in that company is, or in that contract is if they find any sentient life, then all mining has to stop. There has to be a whole process and everything else like that. And up until now, every no, there hasn't been any sentient life that they've found. They did a survey, et cetera. 
but lo and behold, these little two or three foot tall, I, I guess the best way to describe them is, is Ewok like, like capuchin monkey sort of thin sort of thing. Actually, there's a capuchin monkey in there. That's probably why capuchin is coming in my head, but more like, like <laughs> monkey type thin that like live in the trees and things like that. The Scalzi reimagining is very close to what I remember from Little Fuzzy, but he makes some changes in it where the main character is a former lawyer, which I think was in the original one, but the way that they discover that the Fuzzies are intelligent and the way the court works in there is much more in line with what would probably really happen. So the arguments that are made are much much less 1960s of like, oh, suddenly he speaks, therefore he must be intelligent, blah, 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 blah. No, the defense actually throws right. in stuff like, they must mimic things. You you trained him to do that sort of thing. You know, and so there's there's a whole bunch of other uh, other stuff that gets thrown in. And, and Will Wheaton reading it was, uh, he's always a, a good narrator for me. Really, I really enjoyed it. So what was your next book? My next book is uh, Boundless, uh, the, the Lost Fleet Outlands, book one by Jack Campbell. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, Jack Campbell has been writing these books for a goodly long time. I, I think they, they might have been one of the first books on my summer reading list when I started like a dozen years ago or whatever. And so the original book called The Lost Fleet was about this hero named uh, John Black Jack Geary. And he's basically a hero out of time. So in the universe, uh, like 100 years in the past, he is known or he wins this massive battle, but is lost. Right. And so there, this legend comes about that he will one day return and lead the alliance to greater victory. Right. And so in the inter intervening 100 years, there's been just this never ending war between the alliance, which is kind of like the United States ish sort of like good liberal democracy type thing. And the syndics, which are like this overpoweringly corporate uh, bureaucracy, like it's it's like the worst of North Korea and capitalism combined. Right. And he uh, so he comes as the book opens, they find his sleeper pod. And they realize it's him, and he takes command of this fleet. And basically, the first five books or whatever in the series are about him desperately trying to lead the fleet back to Alliance space. Mm. And so there's a, all kinds of like reversals and what have you. And the great thing about the books is that Jack Campbell does a fantastic job of dealing with the actual sort of physics of doing a battle in space, where the battle is across the whole of the solar system, because there's there's faster than light travel between star systems, but once you're within the star system itself, it's much more relativistic. And Understood. So, yeah. I'm using that word correctly. Right. So you're moving at percentage of the speed of light, but it's like one, two, three percent. Now, at that speed, it's still very, very fast. You need computers to do things, but it means that, like, if somebody shows up on the other side of the solar system, you're not going to see them right away because it takes time for light to travel to you to let you right. know that they exist. Right. right. And so. The whole series makes great use of this. Like we don't actually know what's happening because time is displaced and because, well, because the ships are displaced in time, right? Because you're waiting to catch up with what's actually happening. Right. And there's a great political maneuvering and just, he does a very good job of rendering a realistic space opera. And so he wrote this, these first series of books. Then he wrote a follow-up to that series of books. Then he took a break, wrote like, an adjacent series of books. Then he wrote a prequel, <laughs> like two or three books. And now he's finally back to like the leading edge of the timeline and telling us what's going to happen next with, with, uh, with Admiral Blackjack Geary. So I love these books. Cool. I've read the original series. I've read them as like print books first. And then I think I listened to them again as audio books uh, as part of my, my gym routine. And if you like space opera and you like big battles between large star fleets and actual kind of tactics in space, you need to read these books. I've read a lot of books over the years, and I've never read anything that comes close in terms of like the sort of realism and actually applying the logic of space-based combat. So cool. it's, uh, it's great stuff, and I'm, I'm super excited that he came back this year because he had taken this lull, and I was putting together my summer reading list, and like, I wonder if there's a new Lost Fleet book. 
there is and like you know there's like this like 12 year old in me is squeeing like oh my gosh i can't believe it nice now the question is when do i read it right do i read it while i'm at philmont do i save it when i took to take it to lake champlain because traditionally i've read this book at lake champlain or the series of lake champlain. so got it uh that's the big drama that i'll figure out for myself probably gonna be lake champlain Unless I just can't resist the temptation. Like, I've been waiting for this It'll, book. it'll be on your Kindle, I've won't it? I've been subconsciously waiting for this book. Yes, it'll be on my Kindle. Or will it? Because, you know, if it's on my Kindle, then I can give in to the temptation. Right. And there are going to be other books on my Kindle. So. Yep. <laughs> what well, do you have next? Yeah, my next book is uh, The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Kowal. Uh, I'm actually about three quarters of the way through it right now. And I'll probably finish it tomorrow, I think. It's 1952 in an alternate history United States, alternate history world. The Allies still won World War II, uh, but there's, uh, there's some differences uh, in uh, like who was president at the time. But that really doesn't matter, because a, meteor, uh, a meteorite <laughs> hits, hits Washington, D.C., and obliterates it and about everything within 300 miles of it. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture happens to be the only person left uh, in the chain of command. He was, like, in Kansas at the time and becomes president. The main character is Elma York, uh, Dr. Elma York. She's a mathematician and uh, a a computer. Uh, you know, back when computers were actually people who did the math. Uh, <laughs> nice. And... and she and her husband, who is also a Dr. York, uh, is he's part of NACA, N-A-C-A, not NASA, N-A-S-A. And again, this is 1952, and the they were in the Poconos, and so we're like on the very edge of the meteorite strike uh, and the shock wave and everything else that hit. So they survive, get safe, and they uh Elma's brother is a meteorologist, and so and he's in on the west coast. And together with him, the three of them figure out that this is not just bad, the initial strike is bad, but with all the ejecta that's thrown up into the atmosphere and is raining down, and all of the seawater that has been vaporized and thrown up into the atmosphere... There's going to be effectively a nuclear winter for two to five years, and then the greenhouse effect is going to take over, and at some point within the next 20 to 50 years, the oceans are going to boil. And uh, so bad. And so they, because of uh, her husband's placement at NACA and, and her knowledge, they are able to communicate this to what is left of the U.S. government and it's communicated around the world, and they they a international aerospace coalition gets formed to jumpstart, kickstart the the space program, so that all of our human eggs aren't in one basket, because that basket is going to catch on fire pretty soon. And so it's all about the the space race being kickstarted much earlier than it normally was, but also the struggles of being a woman at that time. And like, she's got two degrees. She is a PhD doctorate. And yet one of the things that was happening was they were only sending men up, even though they're going to form a colony on the moon. Colony <laughs> means you have to have women because men and women are required to have babies. And so, you know, it turns out, Turns out, Watership Down has a very similar problem. <laughs> this is unfortunately one of the plot points. <laughs> okay, yeah, it, it is unfortunately true, and the way that it's written is is has kind of opened my eyes a little bit as to the way women, even nowadays, are still treated. Sometimes, you know, talked over, discriminated against in different ways, and just how much it worse it was back in 1952. It's all woven together really well. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. It's uh it's evidently book one. I didn't realize that until today. Book one in a series. Oh, cool. So I'll see I'll see where what sort of cliffhanger it ends on to see if it'll draw me into book two. 
I do love that when you start reading a new series uh, on your summer reading list and like you just you ditch the rest of your reading list just to get through the next book like, because <laughs> the, the first book was so good. Right. And they just launch it the next one and the order's just out the window. Right. Yep. Yep. So what's your next one? Uh, mine is uh, Ancestral Night. Uh, it's my book one of the White Space series by Elizabeth Bear. Um, I have not read it yet. I've read some other works by Elizabeth Bear, and uh, I enjoy her stuff. And so this one, it seems right up my al- my alley. And I'm just going to like read from the description because that's probably the easiest way to do it because I haven't actually read the book. Yet. True details. Yep. So you've got um, Palmy and her partner Kanla are salvage operators living uh, just on the inside of the law. Usually, theirs is a perilous and marginal existence with barely enough chance of striking it fantastically big just once to keep them coming back for more. They pilot their tiny ship into the scars left by the unsuccessful white transitions, searching for the relics of lost human and alien vessels. And uh, it sounds like there's going to be like a discovery of the lifetime lifetime that might change the whole universe. It sounds like exactly the kind of space opera I'm really into. So Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to reading this one. And uh, like I said, it's Elizabeth Barry. If you haven't read her stuff before, it's definitely. I don't think I have. So, so what's, it, it uh, sounds, what do you got? It sounds pretty cool. Yeah, my, I think so. <laughs> yeah. My next one is uh, a nonfiction book. Uh, it's called The End of Everything, Ooh. astrophysically speaking. It's by Katie Mack. I don't, I think I read about it on Twitter, but I don't quite remember why I grabbed it, uh, other than, you know, I like physics and, and astrophysics type books and, and such. Uh, It's been on my nightstand for probably a month and a half now or so. uh, And I I just, I want to set it in the reading list so I actually get to it. But basically, we know, uh, you know, that theoretically the universe began with the Big Bang and, you know, everything has kind of flowed outward from there. What happens at the end of the story? You know, what happens when uh, when the stars burn out? Uh, Does the universe you know, collapse in a big crunch, have a heat, the heat death of the universe. Uh, there's another thing called the big rip, which I, I learned about a few years ago, vacuum decay. Um, and as the, as the thing, <laughs> vacuum decay is, is one of the terrifying ones because, uh, as, as the back of the book says, uh, that, that one could happen at any moment. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, sounds it's bad. Yeah, it's I don't a, know what it is, but it sounds bad. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird one and I can't even remain uh I can't even describe it right now. Um I've I I've, I've heard of it as well, but it's like one of those where it's like yes, it's going to happen, but there is absolutely nothing anyone can do about it, so don't stress over it. <laughs> and it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, if uh you know, we have the whole, you know, we're all going to die someday. So is the universe. Um, here's the couple of the ways that the universe can end and maybe begin again. A little bit, little, little sliver of hope there. So I'm looking forward to reading it. I don't know how sciencey, like, I don't know how deep into the science it gets or if it's written for, for lay people. I once considered myself a non lay person, but I'm realizing that the deeper you get into the physics, the, the, the less I know. I am a computer programmer at heart, not a physicist, even though I like the physics. I hear you. Yep. So what's your next? So I just I just switched up things a little bit. Uh, the, the, the next one is uh, a book I actually read many years ago. And this isn't just like Ken rereads all of his old books. Although maybe <laughs> there's a little bit of that. It's the Trumps of Doom by Roger Zelazny. So this is uh, book six in the Chronicles of Amber series. And I love Chronicles of Amber. We talked about Chronicles of Amber before. The first five books are fantastic. Absolutely love them. Uh, there's this great mix of 70s fantasy and just like infinite worlds and just Zelazny is at his near near best in uh in, in the original chronicles of amber series the second five books i don't not so much <laughs> <laughs> I, I just didn't enjoy them as much as i enjoyed the first five books right however it's been many years since i read them i think the last time i read them was i don't know 20 years ago i read them for the first time when i was in college and then I think I went through the whole series again when the, the big bound Chronicles of Amber book came out, which does not actually have a great binding because it fell apart, um, which may have <laughs> limited some of my reading enjoyment as I got into the latter books. But what drew me in was uh, Will Wheaton is reading this book. And so, like, all right, 
It's been a while. I should give it a second chance or a third chance, I guess. And it's Will Wheaton. And I love listening to Will Wheaton read books. So, as, as you I know, will, I do I too. Give it a chance. So, right. So, in, the, in this particular book, for what it's about, so the first series is all about Corwin, who is one of the Princes of Amber. And it's kind of like the, I'm trying to think, I think it's like the first generation of, of sons and daughters of the King of Amber, right? Yeah. Uh, the second book is about Merwin, which is Corwin's son. Right. kind of deals with the next generation and what they get up to it, the trouble that they get up to in like, as they like have learned more about how to manipulate the universe and, and bring about like interesting constructs, like this huge, like metaphysical com- computational machine. That's only possible by crafting a very special reality. And it's called ghost wheel. Yep. And it can follow Merwin around through the multiverse. And it's just, it's very trippy. I think it's even trippier than the first series of books, but I'm looking forward to it because it's been a while and it's well. Cool. Cool. What do you have next? Yeah. So my next one is I'm going to try the name because it's not, it's weird. It, it, I think it's seven eaves. Yes. I, I think seven you've eaves. read that one. I have many years ago. Yeah. It's uh, this point, it's, to say it. it's, been, it's been a few, it's been a few. Yeah. It's been out for a while. I've always liked the Neil Stevenson books, but every book he writes seems to get exponentially larger. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I picked this one up on Audible. I don't know much about it other than it's a Neil Stevenson book. According to the, the book jacket sort of thing, it's uh, what would happen if the world were ending, a catastrophic event renders the earth a ticking time bomb, and in a feverish race against the inevitable... Nations around the globe band together to devise an ambitious plan to ensure the survival of humanity far beyond our atmosphere in outer space. I didn't know this when I started reading The Calculating Stars. So evidently, (laughs) with The Calculating Stars, The End of Everything, and Seven Eves, uh, I'm on a big uh, let's end the world sort of thing. (laughs) So yeah, I I don't know much about it. Uh, I really, I mean, Neil Stevenson hooked me, and I'm blanking on the first novel. The second one was The Diamond Age, but what was the first one with the oh, pizza delivery deep, driver? Uh, Snow Crash. Snow Crash. Snow Crash. I mean, that, I, this is something that authors hate to hear, but that has to be in my favorite book of his, was the first one of, of his that I read. Even though he's gone on and honed his craft a heck of a lot more that's the story that really sticks with me. So I, I love snow crash. I haven't, I haven't read it in years. Maybe who knows, maybe it'll sneak its way onto my, my uh, reading list again. I just, I yep. love it. I read the audio book for, or the print book. Like it's, it's really just fantastic cyberpunk. Um, and at the time kind of like poking fun at cyberpunk, yes. but still managing to be like really good cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the first chapter is like, you know, talking about this guy and his super sleek car and, zooming along the road and then you find out he's a pizza delivery driver i mean you know and and the the secondary character's name is yt which later on you find out stands for yours truly and the main character is called hero protagonist so yeah there's a lot of poking fun at the at the cyberpunk genre but at the same time it it was it was i liked that juxtaposition of humor and cyberpunk i think one of the things that has always stood with me from stuck with me from reading that book as a kind of like a geek dad because i think i read it when i was i read it in my 30s right like i didn't read it when it actually came out but um the thing that stuck with me was there's this line in the book where hero pregnant protagonist is talking about how up until a certain age like 23 or something like that you can trick yourself into thinking that if your if your life if like your your if family was murdered and like everything was destroyed by some criminal organization, you could train night and day, and become the most badass ninja in the world, and like seek out your vengeance because yep. you could still do that. Yep. Um, after that age, it becomes harder, <laughs> 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 and that's even like, like stuck with yep. me. Like now that I'm almost fifty, right? You know, it still sticks with me, right? Like there's not in the back of your head, your inner twenty or one year old's like, I can totally do that, right? And yep. now I can't. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Although it's 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 funny talking about like themed books. When this when seventies first came out, it came out at this uh, about the same time as Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson, and 
Aurora and Seven Eves end up having very similar themes about like Aurora is about a generational starship that like goes off, tries to colonize another world, and things don't quite work out. And they were both kind of depressing and hopeful in the same sort of ways. And it was it was a little fun. Like it was one of those things. Like I did not at the time I didn't realize just how similar the themes were going to be. But mm -hmm. they reinforced each other in sort of a a pleasant way. But I, I needed a palate cleanser after that. I just needed like stuff blowing up and the heroes win the day. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> After reading the two books. <laughs> yep, yep. I, I have a feeling I'm going to need a second summer reading list that is... I've got more books that I'm, I'm probably not going to talk about today, but that will hopefully be less... Oh, the world's ending. Or Let's the see. universe is ending. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> need a little pick-me-up after the pandemic, right? Yep. So what's uh, what's next on your list? I think we're we're doing five from our lists, right? Yep, yep, yep. I think I'm at, I think I'm at five here. So my my next one is All Systems Red, uh, the first book in the Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells, which yep. I believe you've read. I have read every single Murderbot Diaries installments, shall we say? If you're gonna read this at Philmont, even before you get to it, if you're gonna read this at Philmont, you might want to pick up number two and three because <laughs> they're novellas, so they're they're yep. on the shorter side. They right? are on the shorter side, and they are. As you were mentioning before, you get into a series and you like dump your list and just read the next several books in the series. This is what happened with Murderbot Diaries for me. I can read the blur, but do you want to like since you've read it, do you want to do the like quick description of what it's about? I don't remember the very first one's plot per se, but basically Murderbot is far future and Murderbot is a sec unit and a sec unit is basically a human who has been cybernetically modified at some point, I think like early, early on, and they're not supposed to be intelligent. They're supposed to be just intelligent enough to like follow orders and things like that. Uh, and to justify the fact that these corporations are basically making s slaves. Murderbot at some point hacked her own governor system, which is supposed to fry her brain. Well, actually I keep saying her Murderbot has no gender fry their brain. It's about Murderbot discovering who they are, uh, where they fit in, in the world, in the universe, and, uh, and befriending other humans, even though she kind of hates humans, which is part of the reason why she named herself. Or, I, I do, I've assigned a gender to Murderbot, but right. Murderbot doesn't have a gender. Uh, <laughs> Murderbot, and, and I, I don't know if it's because the author is female or if it's something that comes off in the writing that has has that for me, um, but Murderbot definitely does not have a gender. So Murderbot named itself Murderbot, does not like humans except for the humans that it likes. And so <laughs> it, there's, there's, it's also, the book itself is also a mystery. Um, and most of the novellas are are more mysteries that Murderbot has to solve with all the technology and weapons at its disposal. Why don't you go into how you see Murderbot from like the blurb and such, or or why did you pick? Yeah, it up? so the so, yeah, so I picked it. So actually, I think I think uh, I think Tor released this as a free audio, a free. Uh, uh, I think it was Tor. Um, yeah, released it as like a free download last summer. It was going to be on my list, and I just I just never quite got around to it. I thought I was going to read it throughout the rest of the year, and I never quite got around to it. The, the blurb says, on a distant planet, a team of scientists are conducting surface tests, shadowed by their company supply droid, a self-aware sec unit that has hacked its own governor module, as you say, and refers to itself, though never out loud, as Murderbot. Scornful of humans, all it really wants to do is be left alone long enough to figure out who it is. But when a neighboring mission goes dark, it's up to the scientists and their Murderbot to get to the truth. As to why I want to read it, it reminds me a lot of the HK unit from the Knights of the Old Republic okay. video game. I don't know if it is anything like that, but I just, I like the setup. I thought it sounded interesting. And all the titles for the Murderbot series uh, seem just amusing. Right. And so that's, that's just kind of the hook that, that pulled me in. So, and yeah. it's gotten great reviews at one awards. Like it's, it's a great series. A lot of people have talked about it. So I feel like I, I need to catch up a little bit. It's, it's a very fun it has a very similar feel to it, and, and it reads just as fast as many of the Dresden Files novels do. 
Gotcha. So it's it's written from the point of view of Sec Unit of of Murderbot. Actually, there was one short story that Tor released for free. It might still be up there. That was actually the only story that's written from the point of view of someone other than Murderbot. So <laughs> it's yeah. The the other thing that and I'm blanking on the name of the series. One of the things that Murderbot does while trying to investigate who Murderbot themselves are is watch a particular uh, soap opera constantly. Gets annoyed that they have to go and fight this thing or or save this person because they really they, they wanted to watch their show. <laughs> that sounds um, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really good. Other than the fact that they're novellas. Every time the novella ends, uh, I'm like, I want more, which is a good feeling to have when you are reading a series. It has a similar read to me as Dresden Files, which is, you know, I can rip through a Dresden Files novel really, really fast um, and uh, and not feel that it was, I don't know, it, it it's it's popcorn for my brain. You know, it's not it's not, you know, like the super best novel you know literary novel out there but it hits the the good spots in my brain i think that that's one of the things that i struggle with my with my summer reading list because there's there is good literary stuff out there like deeper that really makes you think but what i have found in my summer reading list is that i i spend an awful lot of time thinking and i would like to to stop thank you please and just <laughs> like read some like a popcorn novel right like i want stuff to blow up um i'm not opposed to like you know uh, I think last year I read the fifth season. I think that was last year. That's a great book, and it's it's fantastic. It took me a little while to get into it, but it, it really makes you think. And yeah. uh, I find that I like those books more, like in the fall and winter. Yep, that was actually one that I'm <laughs> I'm I'm not going to go through, but I had just finished. Uh, I just actually finished the fifth season uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, and yeah, I agree. Uh, I listened to it on Audible when I was doing my walks and and cleaning around the house. And it's one of those deeper ones. And it also is starting to look like a pattern with NK Jemison books when I'm reading them. Cause I, I listened to uh, the city we became where I bounce off of the first chapter or two, but once I get past that, it's super engaging. Right. And so I, I tried that again with this one uh, and, you know, powered through the first couple of chapters and then, and then got sucked in to the story after that. Yeah, it, it, she's she, she's great. It's just like yeah, my my brain just like I think I ended up not even reading it on my summer reading reading list. I ended up reading it like in the fall because it just took me a while to get started on it. So it's great, great book. Definitely read it. But yep. uh, this summer I need starships blowing up in deep space. So. Yep, yep. <laughs> the the second book in the series is further down on my reading list, but it is on my reading list. So speaking of which, my fifth one is Project Hail Mary which evidently is the trifecta of last chance missions where earth could perish. It's Andy Weir, the same guy who, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a great theme going I, here, man. <laughs> I didn't, I did not plan this. Hopefully it's not prophetic or something. Maybe I'm studying up for the upcoming apocalypse. Yeah. So Andy Weir, the same author who wrote the Martian, it's about Ryland Grace, who's a sole survivor on a la desperate last chance mission. And if he fails, humanity and the Earth itself will perish. So, yeah, it just feeds right in to my world-ending apocalyptic. Uh, maybe, maybe this is subconsciously I was pulled in to select these books because, of, because I'm writing the Dyson Fall game, post-apocalyptic Dyson Fall game. Probably not, but it all blends together in my head at some point. Really like Andy Weir's writing style. I'm hoping that it'll be that it'll continue on there. Uh, I read another book of his, uh, Artemis, uh, which was on a moon yes. colony, and that was pretty good, but not as memorable as The Martian. I had actually right. opened up my Kindle and it's like, oh, Artemis, Andy Weir, cool. And then I started reading it. It's like, oh, I read this already. Okay. And then I reminded myself what it what it you know the, of the story, but The Martian stuck with me a lot more than. And Artemis. I'm hoping Project Hail Mary will stick with me more like The Martian. Yeah, so... The Martian I ripped through, like, just over a Christmas break. I think I remember I went up to my parents' house, yeah. and uh, we were, like, spending the week with them, and I had the book out, and it's one of those books where it's, like, 
you're gonna get yelled at because you're being antisocial. Yeah. So please put the book down and come talk with the family. I'm like, but 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 it's awesome. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely forty something year old who doesn't want to like like hang out with his family because I want to go read my book just like I did when I was fourteen. You know. Yeah. Well, it it just shows that we're all still fourteen and inside. You know, even right. no no matter if we get older. <laughs> I agree that The Martian is one of those books uh, where you can definitely do that. I actually enjoyed the book more than I enjoyed the movie. Like, the movie was good, but there was so much more in... It could have been in the movie. This was one where the book was more exciting than parts of the movie were. And some of it wouldn't really have translated, like him trying to figure out how to communicate effectively to Earth using right. the cameras and the rotating discs to figure out what, you know, sending stuff back and forth with the old, uh, old rovers and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, it was really fantastic. And I, I think, um, I enjoyed like the, just the continual problem solving and how, and how, how, and I think I appreciate this as kind of like technologist, like programmer, like person who spends their life in technology, how solving one problem then begat another problem that he had to solve because there were always unintended consequences to the things that we do. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And so a lot of times, like, you know, in a lesser book, people would, you know, he would have just solved the problem and then gone on and like, there would have been to some totally separate challenge. And there is definitely some of that, but there's also things where he burns himself because he, he just didn't think things through. Like, cause we all do that. <laughs> like, like blowing up the, the hab. <laughs> Right, right, right. That he's, Which is that he's growing his own food supply. And the, and the book. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, the last part of the blurb for Project Hail Mary is says, it's an irresistible interstellar adventure as only Andy Weir could deliver. Project Hail Mary is a tale of discovery, speculation, and survival to rival the Martian while taking us to places it, ne it never dreamed of going. So pretty ambitious uh, little blurb there. I'm hoping it lives up to it. It's, you know, he he's still a good writer no matter what. Else. Yes. We'll put the blurb in the in the show notes for anybody who wants to read it. I don't know a whole lot more other than what the blurb is saying. So, but it's Andy Weir, which is why I picked it up. So it's, it's totally it, it's on my list as well, like my my extended list. I will include. Uh, I think we're planning on adding other books to our list as we go along, or just adding our extended list to the show notes as we actually post things. Because you know, why stop at five? But, right. Uh, that that might be another one that makes it on the film on list. Yep. You know, like because you know, surviving on the edge of everything that seems kind of like apropos of any 12 days like through the desert so yep i mean you've said a couple of times that you put your reading list in the order you want to read them in i'll probably never be able to do that because it's it's <laughs> my brain is like what's most interesting right now this one and sometimes i'll have two or three books i don't do it as much anymore but like as a kid i would sometimes have two or three books going at a time it'd be like oh this is the book to oh, read yeah. at lunch at school and this is the the book to read when I get home. And this is the book to read at some other time to have different books in different locations at the house or in my backpack or whatever. And so I'd have to juggle all those stories in my head at the same time, even though I listed these five in, in an order, they will probably not be completed in that order. Yeah. I think I, I have a, I kind of a, I have a vaguely conscious cue. Like when I post them up on my website, I'll, I've put them in various orders. I think this year I'm doing alphabetical. But there is definitely kind of a few that I'm thinking about. I, I think the biggest distinction I make is between what I'm going to read in the early summer and what I'm going to save to read when we go to Lake Champlain. Got it. This year, I have the added thing of going to Philmont and figuring out, you know, okay, what books, if I get to it, will I read? But, you know, there is, because you get into kind of this cadence of books. And so once you start realizing, like you have, like what the books are about, then you start like, oh, I don't know if I want to read two books like this back to back. So I'm right. going to find another thing and put it as a tracer, right? Yeah, I, I have a lot of end of the world, end of the universe books. So I might throw in something like, I don't know, Aliens Phalanx or Pattern Recognition or uh, I don't know, <laughs> something else that <laughs> isn't even on the list that I have right now. So... We'll see. Oh, Indeed, the other we would love. We would love oh, sorry. Go ahead. I I was just gonna say I I just realized that the fifth season was also an apocalyptic sort of thing because the fifth season is a it's on a world with one giant continent and sometimes there'd be this these big tectonic eruptions that would cause effectively nuclear winters and some would only last a little while but at the end of the fifth season book uh stuff is happening and it might be longer 
I don't know what the set, you know, the second book is the obelisk gate is on my, on my reading list. And so we'll see how that goes. Uh, so that's yet another end of the world thing. I think I might need to consciously look for something that is not end of the world. <laughs> or, you know, it could all be good. Yep. You know, you could sprinkle in a few movies there to mix it up, right? Like it doesn't have to be that your cal- palate cleanser doesn't have to be a book. It could true. be, uh, you know, very, very a movie true. or a podcast or something, right? Right. So obviously our, our lists are going to grow through the summer and uh, we're going to release this episode out of order. Uh, so that we can get our summer reading list out in front of folks, uh, well, hopefully before the summer gets too far along. So if you have ideas, you can uh, email them to us at podcast at com, or you can send them to us via Twitter at Lair of Secrets. Yes, at Lair of Secrets. And then you can also visit com and, you know, just post a comment. Let us know what you're planning on reading this summer.